is Lauren. I'm a developer relations engineer at Temporal. And uh, previously, I worked on Temporal's JavaScript runtime. Not another one of those. Um, this one's different. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into uh, how it's different in a bit. And I also wrote a book on GraphQL with John Messick. And I'm a consultant and open source maintainer, or was in the past for a long time. Uh, today, I will introduce something called durable execution and talk about some of the new possibilities that it opens up. And then I'll touch a little bit on, on how it's done, um, how it's provided, and then we'll go through a number of different system design patterns and how they can be simplified once you have durable execution. So what the heck is durable execution? Uh, starting out with what, what normal execution is and uh, uh, an important property of it is that functions fail, normal functions fail to complete executing when a process crashes, maybe you divide it by zero or have an unhandled exception. The process could be killed by the OS, maybe you're running out of memory. The machine could lose power. You could deploy new code and while usually you might have a, um, a graceful shutdown period for the, the previous code running, uh, there's a chance that it will have code that's running long enough that goes past the great for graceful shutdown period and, and gets killed. And then there's also uh, transient failures that can happen in uh, any dependencies that you call like a downstream service. If that's temporarily down, uh, you, you want to retry that. So in durable execution, functions are guaranteed to complete running. Um, so if I have uh, this process order function, and it has three steps. It, it talks to the inventory service to reserve the inventory, then it uh, talks to the payment service to charge for the order, and then it sends a package. And this is running on a process. If I've completed the first two steps, uh, lines two and three, and then the process crashes before I get to step four, this uh, function, if it's a durable function, will continue running on a new process uh, with all state intact uh, from the same location in code. So it'll start running on uh, line four. And uh, all state includes uh, the values of local variables, uh, the call stack, threads. Uh, another thing that durable functions do are uh, is automatically retry any transient failures. Um, for instance, uh, talking to a database that's uh, temporarily unavailable due to the network or due to the database being down, or a downstream service or a third party API. Uh, if there's a a transient retriable failure, it will automatically be retried. So durable execution is coding at a higher level of abstraction, kind of like if you're in a high, lang high, lang high level language like uh, Java or JS, you don't have to manage memory, versus in C you do. Uh, with durable code, you are coding at a, at a level of abstraction in which you don't have to care about faults in the, in the infrastructure running your code, and you also don't have to care about uh, transient faults in any of your dependencies that you're calling. Uh, so a lot of the way, the way in which we code and the way in which we design sy systems is predicated on uh, the fact that the primitive we're building with are, are normal volatile functions that could die at any time. And there are some new possibilities that open up when we have this primitive of a durable function. One of those is sleeping for an arbitrary period of time. So in, in normal code, I can't, I can't write this in production because uh, I don't have confidence that my process will be around in 30 days, and I also don't want to like take up resources like like have a thread blocking on this call because then I run out of threads. In a durable execution, uh, two things. One is I can reliably know that in 30 days my function will continue running and this promise will resolve. Uh, two, I'm not going to take up resources during those 30 days. There's not going to be uh, a thread waiting. Um, the system will automatically see that nothing's happening with this function. It'll unload it just like it would if it if the process crashed, and it will use the same uh, same uh, system for recovering from a crash uh, as it does when, in the normal course of res op operation, the, the the function gets removed from cache, and in 30 days, uh, a timer goes off in a database, and the function gets restarted or not restarted, but like continued from from that line. Another thing that is useful a lot of the time when we have functions that can be running a long time is to be able to uh, 
check their state, like query them, say, hey, what's what's going on? What's your current status? And also uh, send information to them to, to have them change what they're doing. So in Durable Execution, you can uh, send RPCs to your running functions. You also send queries to your closed functions that have, that have completed. And you can also have functions that run forever. So uh, a, a common pattern is called the entity pattern, where you have a function that represents some uh, entity in your uh, application. For instance, uh, a user's customer loyalty program. And you could start the loyalty program function when the user signs up, and then keep it running for the duration of their lifetime as a user, and then, and then uh, return from the function and end it whenever they uh, send you like a, a right to be forgotten GDPR request. And that function can receive information about like what this user is doing, like the orders they're making, and make decisions uh, on what to do based on like how many points they have and and uh, what level they're at and stuff. And that keeping state in that function about uh, their status. If you have functions that can run forever and you can send RPCs to them to uh, send data into it or, or get data out of it, you no longer have to use a database. Uh, you can store your state in a local variable and trust that it will be around for the duration of this function and it will be accurate. So a couple of code examples. Uh, here is a subscription, a, a durable JavaScript function that I want to charge the user a certain amount every 30 days. I'll start with canceled false, and I'll set an RPC handler for the cancel RPC. So whenever somewhere, somewhere else in my system sends a cancel for this uh, subscription function, uh, my function handler will set cancel to true, and then send an email to the user saying your subscription has been canceled. And the main body of this function is while we're not canceled, we'll charge the user and then sleep for 30 days and continue doing that in the loop until canceled. Um, and once we get to the, the sleep line of 30 days, this will uh, result in a sort of automatically for you in a, in a uh, durable timer in the, in the database. And uh, this function will be unloaded because it's not being used. And then it will wake up and continue running either when, you, when it gets a cancel RPC or when the 30-day timer goes off. It'll also uh, automatically retry any uh, transient failures in the dependencies. So uh, if the send email function is talking to a uh, an mailgun and mailgun is temporarily down or charge is talking to Stripe and Stripe is temporarily down, it'll automatically retry. Uh, by default, it's like infinite retry with exponential backup, uh, but you can also like set a maximum number of attempts or change the, the backup uh, exponent or uh, maximum interval, stuff like that. Here's an example of the, the forever function, the loyalty program that you start when the user signs up. And uh, you start route with points at zero, and then you have two RPCs. One RPC is a notify purchase. So anywhere else in my backend system, when, when there's a purchase, we'll call this RPC on this user's loyalty program function. And uh, it'll give it the purchase information so the function can look at the purchase, see the total, calculate a number of points and have some threshold and take some action. Like if the points gets to 10,000, then send a coupon to the user or change their uh, status level. And then we can have uh, another RPC called get points that just returns the, the current number of points. And at the end of the function, we don't want to return and complete it. So we're awaiting a promise that never resolves. And so when the, when the user looks in their like web portal for their number of points, the backend doesn't need to go to a database to look it up. It can talk to this function and say, hey, give me get points, and it'll return the points. So an example of, of using variables for, 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 for persistent state instead of a database. Right, so if I, if I want to get to the user, uh, get rid of the user uh, when they want to be forgotten, I could like combine this with this one and have a cancel RPC and then return whenever uh, cancel became true. Uh, no problem. So in summary, durable execution is process independent. If one process running the function dies, it'll continue running from the same place, some new process. It has automatic retries of any uh, normal code that 
might fail because it's talking uh, to the network and uh, the network is down or the, whatever it's talking to is down. It can sleep for an arbitrary period of time. It can receive RPCs. Uh, the functions can run forever and you can use local variables instead of a database. But how the heck does this work? Um, I, was, I was talking about it to someone and they, they, they said, uh, you must be running on unspecialized hardware. You must be like, uh, the OS must be using uh, an SSD for, for memory instead of RAM. And uh, in, in fact, you can, you can run it on whatever commodity hardware. It doesn't need anything special. And uh, here's the top level sort of system design of the system. On, on the left, we have application developers. On the right, we have the, the platform team that, that hosts the, the server that does the durability. Uh, and the things start on the top left uh, in your application where anywhere in your backend system, you can use the uh, client library, uh, import it, and uh, call functions to uh, call, call a method on the, on the client to start a durable function with a certain argument. And you can also uh, send the RPCs to the function. And there, uh, those, those, the, the li client library is talking to, by, by gRPC to the server, which took care of durability, has a, a database like uh, Postgres or Cassandra, and uh, saves, this, saves the state of the function by saving every event that happened to it, so a start or an RPC, and also saving every event that it does. So uh, anything that the, any result from the, from the function running. Uh, or like intermediary, step, intermediary steps that it takes. Uh, it also has a, a elastic search for so that you can uh, search through your existing or past uh, functions and, and web UI so you can see all the functions you've started and what their state is and what their past history is. Uh, so once you use the client on the top left to say start a loyalty program, the server will save that and also add it to a queue. And then you have a worker pool that, that you're hosting of long running processes that import the worker library. And it also includes your durable code. And so a task will be like, start running this loyalty program function. And um, the worker will, will start the function. And if it gets a, let's say, the client sends a notify purchase RPC to the server, the server will add a notify purchase RPC task to the queue that the worker that has that function in cache is pulling on. So the worker will uh, get that, say, hey, hey temporal server, uh, uh, do you have any tasks? It'll say, yes, run this, run this uh, notify purchase RPC, and here's the, the purchase uh, argument. So let's say that happened a couple of times. There was a, a $50 purchase and a $100 purchase, and then the uh, worker over here that was running the function crashed. Um, and then uh, so somewhere somewhere else in our, in our application, someone sent the get points RPC. So someone with a library uh, sent get points to the server. The worker would pick up the get points, realize that it doesn't have uh, the function running in cache, and it would say, OK, hey, server, I uh, need the entire history of this function. So it'll get the user the user object from the from the start of the function, and it'll get two past notify purchases, the $50 and the $100, and it will run, uh, it'll replay those events um, by starting the function and then by calling the handler twice with those different arguments. Um, and then it will uh, call the get points handler and then return the result back to the server, which will return it back to the, the caller. So that's in a, in a quick nutshell, sort of how it works and how uh, a, a certain large class of durable execution systems uh, provide that guarantee of durability. Here's a family tree, sort of, of, of some of the, the main systems. Uh, I work at Temporal to Bottom. Our co-founders worked at uh, Amazon. Uh, web services and in 2012 released uh, AWS Simple Workflow Framework, um, which was like the, the first uh, public version of, of a durable execution system. And it came out of uh, Amazon being one of the first adopters of, of microservices 
and they realized that you couldn't scalably, practically, uh, synchronously call between services. So they started using queues for everything, uh, communicating between services, sort of a uh, venture driven architecture, and they ran into problems with that. So then they started this workflow thing, um, which uh, is is a, 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 a the first implementation of implementation of durable functions, um, and it's it's continued to be used a lot inside Amazon. Uh, one of the co-founders went to Azure, Microsoft, and made Durable Task Framework, which was so popular that it was adopted by Azure Durable Functions. And they came together uh, at Uber to uh, build, uh, improve their their past ideas and build the Cadence uh, Durable Execution System. And they forked that in 2019 to found Temporal uh, in order to uh, improve developers' lives everywhere and then com continue to improve the project. And, and spread the word. And, and now we're 180 people uh, working on it. It is used by a, a ton of companies, including Stripe, HashiCorp, Coinbase, Datadog. Um, every uh, Coinbase transaction is a durable function. Every Snap story, every Airbnb booking. All right, now now to the, to the, the title promise of, of system design. Um, We'll go through a number of patterns, and I won't assume any knowledge, so I'll try to give a concise overview of what it is, and then uh, how to do it with uh, durable execution, or how it's done for you by durable execution, or, or made easier. Um, and these are a couple of great resources, microservice.io uh, lists a lot of patterns, and Byte Byte Go has a great system design newsletter. So first one is circuit breakers. If I am uh, synchronously calling uh, between my services in my backend, and uh, let's see, I'm there's service A calling me, and I'm B, and I'm calling C, and uh, my requests to C are are taking a long time. Um, uh, C isn't isn't responding to them. I might uh, run out of resources, like number of threads making these calls um, or waiting, and at which point I'm going to start dropping work, and service A calling me. Uh, we'll get uh, unavailable code, and then or or we'll hang, and it'll like have uh, too many threads retrying or or stuck waiting, and then that, that can make a cascading failure. So uh, a common pattern is a circuit breaker where instead of me service B calling service C directly, I'll I'll call through a proxy, and the proxy will pay attention to how often uh, service C is not responding or Erroring out, and um, at some threshold, it'll the, the proxy will set a timeout, and uh, instead of continuing to forward on requests from B to C, it will um, uh, sort of uh, immediately return failure, and then after the timeout, it'll start letting some of the requests through just to see if they work. And if they do, then I'll continue. If they don't, they'll set another timeout and and fail them all. Next is a big one. It's a venture of an architecture, and this is a very common way to stop doing the uh, synchronous calling of services that, that has issues, including the, the circuit breakers. Um, one of the main benefits touted for a venture of an architecture is the decoupling. So the idea, well, first, first let's, let's, let's show how it works. Um, instead of uh, synchronously calling between services, you publish a message to a bus. And the other services are consuming or listening to messages in the bus, uh, and in turn, maybe publishing uh, new messages. So in this case, the client at the top left uh, posts to slash orders to create their order. Uh, the API server handles it, create an order. Or order created event goes to the bus, and then there's a payment service listening to the event, and <clears throat> uh, does something, and then publishes an order paid event. The fulfillment service listens to the order paid event, uh, submits the, the order fulfilled event, and then other services, let's say the analytics service, uh, service can be listening to all of the events. So the, the decoupling here is that, for instance, if the fulfillment service goes down, um, there, there aren't uh, threads in the payment service like trying to make calls and, and 
and and the, the fulfillment service isn't missing calls. Um, the the order paid events can uh, pile up in the queue, and then whenever the full fulfillment service comes back up, it can go through the backlog. So it's a uh, decoupled at runtime. But the, the issue is that it's it's not that decoupled at design time or when you're developing. So if I am like uh, designing my system or uh, evolving my system and trying to make changes, for instance, I'm the I'm the a API server team, and I want to change the name of the order created event or make some breaking change to the data in the event, then I have to figure out, OK, who are all of the services in my organization that consume this event? And so maybe I do a code search, or maybe I have dis distributed tracing set up, and I can like look in the past, OK, uh, what are all the services that have responded to this event in the past? Um, and I can go with that, and hopefully no one else was like using that event uh, to, to build their service that they haven't launched yet, but they're about to. Uh, so, so somehow figure out the, the list of everyone using it. And then I ask them, OK, can you please update your code and deploy a change so that you can support this change in, in my event that I'm publishing? Um, and that, that can uh, take, uh, take, take, take a lot of work and also be uh, error prone. There's, there's a chance of, of bugs if I, if I missed a team or a team didn't, didn't make the change correctly. So it is. Uh, not as nice of a developer experience, and it, it can slow you down from making changes. Uh, the alternative of durable execution, not, uh, but both has the um, runtime decoupling that uh, EDA has. In that, uh, service services can go down, and when they come back up, the the call will eventually succeed, and uh, control will be returned to your um, durable function. But they also have uh, a much better uh, cup, uh, looser coupling and, and better developer experience uh, when you're designing and, and developing and, and evolving your code or your system. Because you can just look at the, the code to see what it does. So in this case, I have to like sort of, it's, it's sort of like emergent behavior of like, what is this system doing? I have to like observe it to figure out what the steps of each function are or each uh, business process. Um, here I'm sort of like, I have to figure out based on the order of the events and the, the names of the events that the API server goes first and then the payment service and then the fulfillment service. But if I had a, a single function that just called them, that, that appeared to call them synchronously in order, then I can read the business flow and I can change it more easily. Um, and my entire team can, can edit this function and understand what's happening more easily. Next one, sagas. OK, saga, or a long-running transaction, is a transaction in which I uh, don't hold locks. I do a series of discrete steps. And uh, if one of the steps fails, I, do, I, I undo the previous steps uh, in what are called compensating transactions. So in this example, uh, if it, there's a process order function and it has three steps, the reserve, charge, and send package, if uh, the send package fails, I want to undo the charge and undo the uh, reser res reservation in the inventory service. And if I have a durable function, I can code it like this. I can uh, use try catch. So, so let's say I successfully reserve, and then I successfully charge, and then I try to call send package. But some, and if some transient failure happens, then uh, it'll automatically be retried and won't throw. If a non-retriable error happens, so let's say like, uh, and, and you like decide which are retriable and which are not, depending on your application. But let's say the address doesn't exist error. We, we can't retry and, and fix that. So uh, it'll be thrown out of the send package, uh, caught here, and then we'll refund. So undo the charge, and then throw to here, and then unreserve, which will undo the, the inventory reservation. So that's pretty straightforward. You can read it and understand it, uh, and it's easy to code. You can't do that in a, a normal function because uh, you can't guarantee the correctness of the transaction because you won't be able to complete the transaction. Like you won't be able to continue doing this refund step if the process dies after the 
the send package throws. Uh, so we, if this is a volatile function, it, it's, it's not a correct implementation of Asaga. Uh, instead, what you do is either choreography or orchestration. And choreography is like the, um, the event-driven architecture way of, of putting messages to a bus in each uh, process. Each, each step in the process is responding to messages on the bus and, and publishing. And the other way is orchestration, where you have some central orchestrator and you're giving it a list of steps in uh, traditionally in like a, a JSON file or a YAML or a drawing a, um, a DAG in a, in a UI. And uh, Chris Richardson, the, the author of Microservices IO and the Microservices Patterns book, uh, recommends generally using orchestration because of how complex choreography can get, similar to how we're talking how complex EDA can get. And uh, the downside, so recommends orchestration. Uh, the downside of orchestration is that you are defining your logic in markup files. So like if you did a if then statement, there are sort of like keys in like JSON or YAML or whatever. Um, if you're doing a for loop, again, it's in markup. And it's just not a nice experience. If, if, you're, if you're like defining code, I mean defining logic, uh, it's, it's much nicer to do it in code. Uh, you have more flexibility. You can uh, have all your development tools. You can run it locally, you can debug it, et cetera. Uh, so uh, durable functions are also um, considered like a, like a, a code-based uh, automatic form of uh, orchestration. Transactional outboxes. OK, so if we're using EDA, um, oftentimes, if I'm a service and, I, and I'm consuming a message, I usually have my own data store, and I make some change to my uh, database, and then I publish the next message to the bus. Uh, the problem with this is that if something happens, let's say I'm the fulfillment service again, and I got the order paid, I added the uh, the like fulfillment record to my fulfillment database, and then I publish uh, the order fulfilled message uh, to the bus. If between those two steps, the the order data, the fulfillment order database and the uh, uh, producing of the the order fulfilled event, if uh, my process crashes, then uh, there's uh, a problem in the system. Similarly, if I like, was the payment service and I crashed before order paid, then I've I've charged this user, but they're never going to get their uh, package. So uh, the way around this is a transactional ask transactional outbox or transfer queue in which um, in the partition of the database in which you are making your uh, state update uh, in a transaction, you also add to like a middle, mini, mini queue in that partition. Uh, so if you're the payment service, I, I add this payment uh, to my DB, and I also add an order paid um, event to my mini transfer queue in that partition. And there's some other uh, component or process that is looking for all of the mini queues, looking for tasks on them, taking them off, uh, or, or re reading them, trying to send them to the bus. If it successfully sends to the bus, uh, takes it off the queue. Uh, otherwise, it'll retry. Uh, so that's a a way to uh, get atomicity on that update uh, across, uh, eventually consistent with the with the message bus. Um, and if you don't do this uh, every time you are publishing to the bus, then you have this uh, consistency, data consistency issue, uh, and uh, a lack of fault, fault tolerance there. So that's transactional outboxes. Um, in durable functions, we don't have the problem because you are guaranteed that the next step will happen. So if I have two lines in my function, one, update DB, two, publish to the bus, I know that the second one will eventually happen. So it's, it's not relevant to durable functions. Event sourcing. Um, so this is a, a technique of in uh, storing state as a, a log of events, a, a append-only immutable log. So in this example, uh, the top is an order table in like traditional without event sourcing database. And it's not three rows, it's a single row, and it's just uh, three different states over time. Uh, we start out with this order with a quantity of five, and then the next version of this row, we set the quantity to six, and then 
we set the state to paid. So it's a create and then two updates. Um, in the event sourcing version, we're not updating any rows. We're inserting uh, this first event of a new order, then we insert another event with a modify order set, setting the quantity to six, and then another event uh, of the order pane. And I guess you might think, okay, that's that's not really convenient. I can't query the, the state of the order now. I have to read the whole event log. Um, that's a good point. Uh, so usually you have a, a separate read database or data store that, or one or more of them that are uh, following the events in the log and constructing or materializing uh, some view of the current state of the data. So uh, in for durable functions, uh, they, they're sort of implemented with event sourcing. So under the hood, every event that happens, like I said, every uh, event coming externally from the client, like a start function or RPC, is getting saved in an event log. And everything that the function does also gets saved in an event log. And that's sort of like automatic, uh, something you get um, because that's how it's implemented. And some uh, benefits of that are this audibility. You can you can have complete visibility about what that past happened, what happened in the past to this uh, model in your system, um, and you also get replayability. So you can replay the history of this function uh, to uh, any point in time, which is really helpful for debugging. CQRS is stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. This is when your commands or mutations, the things that, that write or, or update state, uh, are different from your queries or your reading state. And oftentimes, that's completely separate databases. And here's what that looks like. If I have a client talking to the UI, and they want to create a record, th that will get routed to the, the command part of the system, which will uh, talk to the write database, and then eventually, updates the right database and get uh, propagated to the read database, which has some material materialized view that's good for querying. And that could be like, uh, I, I guess, uh, similar to event sourcing, you need some uh, current state of the database. And in event sourcing, like you might be able to, if you're using Kafka for the, for the event log, you could use k-tables for um, the materialized view in here. If you're using, uh, you could use like Debezium to do the change data capture of all the changes to the right database to get them to some read database. And in durable functions, uh, it's sort of not needed be if, you, if you're uh, storing data in local variables, um, you don't need to separate this out. And it's not eventually consistent, the reads, they are fully consistent because uh, queries or RPCs that, that read data will only run after all of the uh, writes have happened that have arrived previously. And also, I guess another similarity is like uh, the materialized view of the read database here is sort of like the current status of the function that has been materialized through all of the, through the application of all of the past events. Another one is distributed cron jobs. So if I want to do uh, some kind of periodic task in my back end, I could uh, put, a, put a Linux cron on a single machine. Uh, issue would be the, the reliability, the machine going down, or uh, not having enough throughput to handle a, a large load of, of cron jobs. So oftentimes we need some kind of distributed cron system. Uh, and in temporal, in temporal and, and other durable execution systems, you have something that's uh, really easy to use. You just sleep. Um, and you, you know that it will uh, wake up whenever the sleep uh, period is done, and it also scales very well uh, horizontally to a high, a high total number of like running functions with sleeps, and also a, a very high throughput in terms of like functions that are waking up at the same time. Task use, a common pattern if like I want to do some async work, or I want to do something like really reliably. Let's say I am a YouTube API server. I'm getting a, 
a video upload from a user. I can't just like start processing that in my uh, web application process um, for a number of reasons. One, like my resources are, are uh, like how much RAM or CPU I have is like tailored to my job of, of answering requests. And uh, I don't have time for this like uh, video processing thing. I've got to keep on uh, handling requests. And it's also uh, not reliable. If something happens to me, my process, uh, we've lost the state of the the video and, and its encoding process. So what you do is you, you put it on the queue, you save it to a blob store, uh, put a task on a queue with a link to the blob store, and then there are workers that are, are checking the queue for work and uh, changing that file into different different um, formats and chunking it up. And when they when the workers pick, are picking things up in the queue, they are sort of provisionally marking it taken, uh, and then once they do the work, then they'll uh, mark it as complete, so that if they die uh, during the while they're doing the work, some other worker can come back later and say, uh, "Give me all tasks that have been claimed but not completed, and were last claimed like over an hour ago, and they should should have been done by now. So if they haven't been done, uh, I'm going to need to retry it." So that's like a way of reliably making sure things are done. And it's a very, very common pattern. And it's something you don't need to do with Drupal execution because uh, every step that happens is automatically put on a task queue for you um, and automatically pulled reliably by uh, the worker library. So anytime uh, you, get, you get a start function, the server, the server will put it on a queue. An RPC, the server will put that on a queue. Um, every time there's some result from the Drupal function, like ch charge this user, that like charge user is like a, a, a command to run a, a normal function, like uh, that talks to Stripe, that also goes on a queue. Next up, state machines. So if I have some important process and it goes through a number of states, um, and I wanna like not redo some of the, the steps, I often find myself like checkpointing state to the database so that I know if I died, what state I was in. Um, and, and, and oftentimes it's structured in a way such that like there are workers pulling on a task queue uh, to do each part, each, each state transition, uh, whatever work is involved there. And uh, that can be a lot of work, like you're, you're doing the, the rights to the database, the rights to the queue, you're doing the logic for the worker polling. And in, uh, if you have a durable function, you don't have to do all that. You can still structure your code as a state machine, but you can store the current state in a local variable. So that's all the design patterns. Um, to, to recap, circuit breakers, uh, that's sort of automatically done for you in temporal uh, and durable execution because uh, Things are, it, you, it might seem from the from the function definition like you're synchronously calling another service, but it's actually under the hood being put on a queue. Event-driven architecture uh, gets pretty complicated. It's nice that it's loosely coupled at runtime, but not at development time. Uh, durable functions, uh, great DX development time and design time uh, in addition to the runtime decoupling. Sagas, uh, really easy to do when you can uh, when, you're, when you can depend on the fact that this function will continue running. Transactional, out, transactional outboxes, transfer queues. Um, also, similarly, you don't need to worry about the next step not executing. Event sourcing, done automatically. CQRS, uh, kind of not relevant slash done automatically. Uh, distributed cron jobs, easy to do. Task queues, done automatically. Sleep machines, uh, much easier to do. Uh, so to recap, we talked about what Drupal ex execution is. We talked about some no new possibilities that, that that primitive opens up for you. Um, how, how a little bit on on how it works, and went through a number of different system design patterns, uh, before and after. If you'd like to learn more, uh, we've got our website on the left and Twitter, and on the right is the slides. And I'd be happy to take questions for the next four minutes. <laughs>